Uh, what I want to talk about today is why we need to fix patents now. Um, there's basically seven points. Progress proceeds at the rate of science and technology innovation. This is a critical century. We need safe, fast, and efficient progress. Innovation, broadly defined uh, as research and development, is greatly rate limited by incentive systems. Crypto econ enables planetary scale changes. Patents are a key worldwide innovation incentive system that we should be thinking about fixing. Given that it's there, we should be one of the candidate things that we could do is try and fix that system. And therefore, we need a program to try and fix patents now. Uh, I'll finish with some potential ideas and directions of how to get started. Uh, and it's been really great to uh, follow all the discussions today. I think it's been um, uh, phenomenal to get all of the ideas out. And it just kind of reinforces the whole point of why we need these kinds of discussions. Um, so I want to start talking about science and technology. Uh, science is a, a process of knowledge expansion. Uh, it's our systemized, systematized way of uh, refining the meme graph, um, expanding what, extending what we know. And over time, we turn that science and that knowledge into technologies, um, embodied knowledge, knowledge as rearranged matter to ex extend our capabilities. Um, sometimes it's not, it's not matter. Sometimes it's technologies include um, systems and programs and, um, and, and so on. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's some interplay between these two things where, in, on the one hand, we're expanding what we know, and over time, we're translating that increase in knowledge into an expansion of tooling, which we then reinforce back into expanding what we know and so on. And this basic process, which is really one thing, it's an integrated system, it's not really two things, um, is behind the last um, million years of progress or so, uh, <laughs> including, including that <laughs> music. Uh, that, so you know, a million years ago, there were no such things, and now there are such things. And uh, we, science and technology really yielded this. Uh, in the last few centuries, we've, we've had an enormous amount of global improvement. And amongst, you, you can look at many factors of, hum, of the human condition, and you can see this, this just broad improvement um, that it lags behind the uh, innovations in what we know, the expansion of our knowledge, and the translation of that knowledge into systems and technologies, technologies that are um, made broadly accessible. So by changing the, the system by which we know more things, or the systems by which we translate what we know into how we can use our knowledge to improve our capabilities, um, we can more or less fix any problem and improve the human condition broadly. Um, and you know, there's all kinds of measures of this and so on. And all, all, we, we're used to seeing the kind of waves of innovations and you know, all kinds of diagrams that show the um, compounding acceleration of, of inventions and, so, and, and whatnot. Um, this kind of innovation process of going from um, basic research into de developing and refining um, devices to then broadly um, uh, deploy them and so on is a lengthy process that involves many fields, involves many groups, many different ways of working, uh, many different fields of knowledge. It's, it's highly integrative. Um, and I think we can all agree here is not going nearly as fast as it could go. Um, and it's certainly not nearly as assisted by technology as it could be. Uh, also, th there's an <laughs> important thing to flag here, like the number of inventions and the number of papers um, describing new knowledge or patents and so on is reaching a level that no human or even groups of humans could be ever expected to handle without um, broadly enhanced capabilities through computing. And, and so we're kind of like at a point where we just can, kind of can't deal with the amount of um, natural language PDFs out there. Um, and so this is really past the point of now using AI systems to be able to deal with this. And if we're going to go in that route, we might as well systematize the thing and build better, better structures. Um, one really important piece here is that ideas, whether it's basic uh, fundamental concepts or um, refinement of ideas into devices and so on, really couple in networks. And um, going back to that know-how discussion, um, once people or groups explore a certain region of the space, 
they tend to kind of generate lots and lots and lots of um, very small ideas that are sometimes critical uh, to making something work. And we don't really have a good way to explore this massive um, knowledge graph. And we don't have a good way of mapping that knowledge graph to who has that knowledge or um, what that, how that knowledge is embodied into things or how to learn that knowledge and whatnot. Um, and we don't have good incentive structures, and we'll get to this in a moment, for how to uh, drive the generation of more of this knowledge um, and, and, and the generation of more explanatory material to learn this knowledge and um, the exploration of uh, devices or, or kind of incremental knowledge to get to something that can be broadly used. Uh, so th this is a critical century. Um, I think we, uh, even though things have been, been getting tremendously better, we're now confronted with a kind of ridiculous list of X risks and um, this kind of also ridiculous um, <laughs> face transition of um, humanity. And our macro systems are pretty much inadequate uh, to be able to handle these kinds of risks. Um, you know, the climate crisis is a good example of like how poorly our macro systems can deal with something of this scale. Um, and so we're kind of left with the, with the conclusion that we basically have to use a different process or a different set of systems to try and um, have change at this scale. You can use what's there, but changing the macro system in, in, in these timelines is kind of, um, kind of fraught. Like it could happen, but it's very difficult. Um, one <laughs> really good news is that the internet um, is just, uh, really enables this massively um, compounding uh, platform for the diffusion of new superpowers, the scale up of those superpowers, and the optimization of, of systems. Um, it's kind of amazing the, the degree of uh, engineering uh, and analysis and optimization that goes into um, extremely basic things at this point. Um, the, the level of engineering and optimization going into um, just our phones or um, like our, the hard drives and computers, or SSDs, um, is in some measures dramatically more complex than all the engineering we've put into the patent system. Um, so when you think about like spinning drives or like um, solid state memories or something like that, it's just, it, it involves um, uh, extremely difficult engineering and somehow we've managed to organize the planet to mass produce these things, constantly be innovating in them and improving them um, and diffusing that innovation. And, um, and that's hardware, let alone uh, how we're doing uh, the systems that we're building of that, that kind of scale and complexity entirely in the software space. So we should be able to um, design and improve and diffuse uh, and, and scale up um, better systems, um, especially if they're only software, um, that can kind of fix our incentive system around knowledge generation and the translation of that knowledge into devices and technologies that we can use. Um, it's also like uh, useful that today the uh, world sort of, uh, the macroeconomic systems uh, sort of recognize the value of the, um, the, how ideas and knowledge have like transformed the economy. And, and these days, most of the value generating um, corporations and so on tend to be in the purely ideas or purely software or purely um, intangible assets type of um, value creation, um, which was sort of like predicted many decades before and sort of eventually happened. Um, now the good news in all of this is that uh, in the last, um, thanks to the, like the last 30 years of um, computing installation, um, but really sort of like the last 10, 15 of um, um, blockchain system de deployment, we now have an extremely powerful set of tools where we can bring mechanism design to bear on the problem. Um, before blockchains, um, you could design mechanisms, but the way to deploy them into the world was by convincing a lot of people um, by um, appealing to the legal system by designing contracts and instruments um, and eventually kind of getting those things into government, which was great in kind of pre-computing timelines. Like that was a great way to innovate um, before you had computers. But now that you have computers, you can really innovate at a totally different uh, time scale and a different level of scalability. Um, and so that's where bringing, um, like <laughs> the new law is uh, mechanism design. And if you can use mechanism design to uh, shift and create a new, um, patent framework or a new innovating, innovation incentive system, um, you can uh, speed up this transition. Uh, so one, one important component here is that um, I urge everyone thinking about all this to uh, think about this in terms of Paradotopia, which is a whole set of concepts that I won't go deep into right now, but 
Um, the broad idea is that when you consider the um, potential, imp like when you look back in history and you see the, the improvement over time um, and the compounding improvement over time and, and, and all the benefits that have come from that, and you kind of think about the future and project that out, um, most of the value creation in the future um, greatly eclipses the value generation today. And so it is just in everybody's best interest to try and collaborate as much as possible uh, to not uh, co uh, compete or create conflict and to try and kind of vault into that future um, as quickly, safely, and efficiently as we can. Um, and the good news is we can use cryptoeconomics as a way to um, uh, navigate the landscape and get there. So um, innovation, from my perspective, innovation is greatly rate limited by incentive systems. Um, you know, a lot of us here admire Bell Labs uh, as one of the kind of quintessential um, places where innovation just happened um, extremely predictably at great speed and kind of in, in an astounding um, uh, set of like uh, creativity and generativity and so on. Um, and so it was, it was really an amazing kind of, um, you know, as this figure describes, hive of invention. Um, this is kind of a, a, a map uh, that David had put together of the um, process of going from going across stages in the R&D pipeline that Bell Labs built. Uh, and so it gives you a perspective of how long innovation took um, at that, in, in that place. And take in mind, uh, bear in mind that this was way faster than the rest of the world at the time. Uh, but this should put into perspective how um, across this large time scale, um, you're dealing with lots and lots and lots of researchers and developers and engineers and so on um, that are involved in many different parts of the process. Uh, one thing that I like to think about here is that there's a, there's a um, qualitatively different thing that happens before and after discovery. So before discovery, you have a lot of different groups exploring potential problems and potential solutions. And um, you can sort of count those numbers of groups and so on. Um, and, and, and can think about how to incentivize those groups and to try and get to, to some, some invention. Um, but once they do, um, the refinement of that core concept into something that can be broadly used and, and um, that can enhance capabilities, the number of groups downstream of that greatly eclipses the number of groups before. So you can think of like this divergent discovery process where you kind of try and figure out what you know, which is kind of how, how academia is functioning today. Um, and then once you have like a fundamental conceptual discovery that, that is broadly recognized as like the big deal invention, um, like say a transistor, um, and kind of you, know, you have like the prototype um, transistor in front of you and like it does the thing. Going from there to you have a miniaturized thing that you can put into a product requires hundreds of thousands of other um, researchers and engineers and developers and so on to put into, into action. And so the bulk of the invention process actually is downstream of the fundamental discovery. Even though um, for um, most of history we've kind of like learned to greatly value those really big leaps because they do kind of create something fundamentally different. Um, it's really the, the bulk of the, of the innovation work is downstream of that, and that's the part that we're not incentivizing well. So I've come to kind of think of this as this uh, chasm in between science and technology, where um, you basically have two broad fields of incentives operating. Um, in the technology side, you have broad markets, and this, you know, today this is mostly corporations driving this. Um, maybe in the 50s it was governments, but uh, today it's, co it's corporations. They tend to try and maximize uh, cash flows, um, they sort of rely on the public markets to, to do their thing. Um, that's working relatively well. Um, of course, room for improvement, but it, it sort of, once you have a thing that's close to a product, you can scale it. On the other side, in, in the science uh, part, um, you have a field that uh, is based on academic credit um, that really prioritizes those conceptual discoveries, um, but it doesn't prioritize any of that kind of refinement of um, an improvement of processes in the middle. So you end up with a, with a um, good incentive to produce like really new fundamental conceptual discoveries, but no strong incentive to actually translate any of that knowledge into devices that can expand technology um, or that can expand our capabilities. So you have this like broad problem in the R in, in the R and D translation process is not well incentivized, and there isn't a good uh, mechanism here. Um, uh, it, the the kind of like litmus test for this is just walk into any VC office today, like the the, the craziest, most like futuristic thinking. VC that you can find on the planet and talk to them about how you're going to refine some process, some hardware thing that is like a 10 year out time scale. Like they'll be like, hey, it sounds great. Uh, come back to me when, once you're like within three years of, of having a product. Um, 
Uh, you know, ex weird exceptions exist, but basically, if anyone is managing other people's money, they can't actually invest in you. Um, so we're, we're missing this kind of effective coordination system to bridge this. Um, and traditionally, this is where patents came in. They try to generate an instrument to create a way of um, hooking this part of the chasm into the broad econo economy, um, but, they, but it doesn't work. Um, and I'll uh, touch on it a little bit later, but um, this area, I think, if we can find way better ways to coordinate large groups of people and organizations and um, uh, to kind of do this process faster, then we can solve um, most of the problems that we have. Uh, so, so I would argue like this is the core like, loop. If we optimize this loop, we can solve anything else. Um, but the uh, and, and so incentive structures are a good way of doing this. They're not the only way, but but they might but they're a really good way. Um, I didn't think about this in terms of a long pipeline with all kinds of individual um, artifacts produced along the way, whether it's an idea or a, a potential um, uh, discovery or or an actual discovery or uh, or that know-how. Like it, it really is a very very large network and bundle of knowledge and. Um, whether it's conceptual or about refinement of a thing. And then eventually this translates into things that you can put into products um, and eventually sell them into a market and to then um, get the cash flow to be able to fund the rest of the operation. Um, that second part is like the, the adapter to the you know, 20th century and 21st century economy. You may not need that in a different economy, <laughs> economy but like that's, a, that's an exercise left for future civilizations. Um, the, um, so I think today you could um, it, we could use mechanism design to change this pipeline to broadly accelerate si the science and technology diffusion, but it's going to require um, deep exploration of new kinds of incentive structures to fit in there, and that includes uh, exploring the patent system. Um, a, a brief aside, uh, crypt, uh, so I mentioned cryptoeconomics and, and um, Paratopian outcomes. Um, just get, diving into the details here, what this really is about is exploring different kinds of um, uh, programs and structures that you can deploy into the network um, to cause massive scale action. And th this is a tremendously powerful new set of tools. Um, I w uh, not enough time to go into detail, but um, we've just gotten a taste of it in the Plasma community by deploying basically one major incentive structure, which is just a periodic reward for um, bringing storage power into the network. And that single mechanism caused this enormous, um, massive scale network to assemble out of the um, ether, basically. Uh, but in our case, Filecoin. Um, <laughs> the way, uh, so I, I have like a mixed um, perspective on patents. Like uh, for most of my life, I've been very anti-patent. Um, I think that they're like really toxic instruments that once you create them, it's very difficult to undo. Um, and once you make that kind of like copyright, once it's there, it, there's like decades involved. And <laughs> that's a very, very difficult imposition that you can place upon um, uh, humanity and so on. It's kind of like a, this kind of, it, for, for a long time, it's, I sort of see it as like a, so it's a, as a wrong turn in history that like we made these things. Um, and I've always sort of understood the, the point and the, and the, the idea of, of why we want patents. Um, but they never quite seem to work uh, to me. And I think one of the, the key components is just the, the broken transaction cost. So I think the model of how patents work is, is uh, um, just doesn't, hasn't worked for a, for a century or so. And I think there are some domains that, where they do work, but those are special cases. I think the, the pharma example is more of a, um, a of that instrument works in that environment because of how academia in bio works and how pharma works and they've co-evolved with the patent system into that complex, and you could achieve that same kind of success without patents or, or with a different kind of instrument. And so the thing today, um, what, we need to what we need to think about is how could you create a, a new kind of structure pat for patents, um, ideally using the existing legal structure because changing it is extremely difficult and, and, um, um, extremely difficult and slow. Uh, so ideally using the existing structure, uh, but to ideally turn it into a software-only system, or primarily software system, that brings the transaction cost down to close to zero, where um, it should be as easy as, uh, as renting a room in Airbnb. So one of my favorite examples for 
for um, changing transaction costs is Airbnb because uh, you know think of the world before that marketplace existed and think of you know getting to a city that day and deciding that you're going to like look at t all of the rooms of the houses around you and try to like pick the one you really want across you know wide variety of features and um, pay somebody to stay in their their home and, and just the idea that like you can now have a software tool that allows you to do that to really kind of browse through everybody's rooms pick one and book it and be done and like show up and, and stay there um, it's kind of wild compared to to where we were before um, and what that really was about was taking a look at existing assets and existing potential transactions and refining the transaction cost. It's, it's creating a, and primi primarily by the invention of a marketplace. Um, so they didn't really have to create a new instrument. You could use the existing uh, payment rails. You could use the existing structures and so on. But all you really had to do was create a marketplace that enabled a different kind of transaction um, and to do a lot of kind of upfront um, uploading of information um, to make that marketplace work. So this includes like the photos, the reviews, the kind of like iterated game of like uh, deploying good reviews to make sure that um, everything, all the feedback optimizes the system to produce like a really good, good result. And so I think like things of that nature, marketplaces, um, different ways of selling the instrument, ways of, of creating a, a preemptive agreement to like not litigate it at, at all, or, or creating bounds in terms of cost, could change the landscape of patents completely without having to require any um, policy shift. Uh, policy shif shifts could be useful, but they're just in general pretty, pretty difficult. Um, so I think um, we need kind of exploration of all, all of these kinds of structures. So anyway, I think we need a program to fix patents, and I think we need to f fix patents now um, because we need to solve these planetary scale problems quickly and efficiently and safely. Um, and so I think like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very kind of, hesitant to describe pro uh, programs because sometimes you uh, try and like give people a list of problems to go solve and then sometimes people show up and break your program and then um, uh, yield a completely different uh, trajectory than what you expected. Um, but sometimes they do go work well uh, and sometimes programs do, do succeed. Um, so I think, I, I don't have a program to propose at the moment, um, but I think in, in general, what we should be doing is, is getting towards um, field building. Uh, so gather and systematize the knowledge of what patents are, how do they work, how are they broken, what could they be. Um, get a lot of people to dream them up, new structures and new ideas for how patents might work. Um, and then gather and empower people and organizations to explore the landscape. Um, and once we have some candidate solutions uh, and we, we have like made sure that they're good, better structures and better assets and so on, then at that point scale them and, and let them um, be, become a larger part of society and the economy and so on. Um, so yeah, I think marketplaces are a really, really good place to look. Um, let's explore how those work. Um, look at, I think the NFT royalty is, a, is an idea that is like broadly um, underappreciated. I think it's a very good idea to include in this a, a, a royalty component that is just automatic as part of a blockchain. Um, the trading volume of NFTs just gives us an, a glimpse into what's possible around IP. Um, I think that this is uh, very, very good and healthy for the IP world if, um, if we can make it into like a good and ethical system because like I, share all the same reservations that have been expressed today about like these things are like toxic assets and like you don't you you want to be very careful if you make them um, and and ideally you could create like royalty networks and royalty streams and royalty systems that can um, uh, interlink all these things um, I think if we do this right like we could even create things like um, crypto powered ARPA systems and and so on uh, the there's a broader effort around um, regenerative finance systems that this field could uh, incubate in and eventually grow. Uh, so I think things like Shelling Point and Funding the Commons are good places to, to explore this. Um, and uh, I'll leave with an invitation to whoever wants to think about this. Uh, there's a conference happen in, happening in two weeks or a quarter in a few weeks <laughs> uh, that you can submit some ideas for, um, uh, for, for, uh, for new uh, con conceptions of the problem new constructions, new marketplaces, um, tell us why this won't work, break the program, whatever, uh, or propose a program, um, but would, would love to uh, have you there. And um, yeah, I will finish by saying new ideas are here needed. Thank you.